Okay. So if you haven't seen my Why Worm Has the Best Premise video, then this video is going to sound like the incoherent ramblings of a madman. If you have seen it, it might just sound like the coherent ramblings of a madman. A much preferable result. I wrote that video all the way back in April, so I've had a lot more time and a lot more stories to rethink it with. I almost did what I do to all my old scripts, which is record it in a timely manner, begin editing a bit ahead of schedule, realize just how shitty it is, rewrite the whole thing in a frenzy, re-record it, and stay up until 3 in the morning editing. This time, the changes I wanted to make would have distracted from the point of that video and made it way longer, so I decided to just relax, take it easy, split it into two parts. All right, that's enough goddamn relaxing, we got work to do. Quick, summary of the last video, stat. In stories, specifically superhero stories, the reason people get their powers, use them to fight evil instead of other things, become superheroes and villains, and have weirdly specific drawbacks and weaknesses, is because we, the audience of said stories, want to enjoy and learn from their conflict. So what Worm's premise did was simply turn that into the actual reason people got powers through the narrative device that is the entities. Instead of every single contrived reason that this person got a power that has arbitrary limitations and they aren't using it for anything but punching people, Worm just has one reason. So what about other fiction, hmm? Worm flipped the superpowered switch in my mind because it's really friggin' efficient with this kind of thing. But it's far from the only story to use the basic principle of this is for an audience to generate conflict. You could even call Hunger Games an example. Why does something bad happen to Katniss when she tries to get a reprieve? Because it's supposed to be entertaining! We don't want to watch Katniss stick around and hide in the forest, and neither does the Capitol, so light that shit up! It's just that now, instead of shards hoping to glean knowledge and understanding by experiencing humanity's most conflicted moments, we as the audience are just rich dickheads. I'll admit that having the story take place in a game is a slightly more specific example, so let's focus our efforts back to the more simple concept of giant power-granting aliens, shall we? Worm is also not exactly the first to play with this idea. In Hard Magic by Larry Correa, the main characters find out pretty quickly that their 1930s magic world is actually the result of a giant-ass cosmic jellyfish that hands out a specific set of 12 or so powers that people can end up with. You could be a torch and control fire, or a, what is it, a summoner? Basically, you can possess a squirrel. It really is similar to Scion and the rest of the entities, except that there's no conflict drive. Wait, there's no conflict drive? Well then what the fuck was the point? Okay, yes. The conflict drive is what I see as the most valuable part of Worm's premise. If the characters acted exactly like real people did, then, much like real people, the story would be no fun, boring, and difficult to understand. If their behavior were exaggerated without explanation, my suspension of disbelief would be raising its hand in the back. I see you back there, CinemaSins. I'm just trying to ignore you. Worm is a book that strikes one of those perfect balances on the tightrope. Or more like the premise just widened the rope so it's easier to balance on. Wait, but a slack line is more difficult than a tightrope and it's wider. Oh, but maybe because it's slack. I'm not getting nearly as much out of this metaphor as I'm putting in. It's gotta be a symbiotic relationship, but now it's turned parasitic where I just continue the metaphors and they don't actually help me explain anything. It's almost like they give me this superpower, but the cost of that superpower is so shitty that it's not worth having the power in the first place. Oh look, that was so off topic it wrapped right back around. The Grim Noir Chronicles got rid of their conflict drive, yeah, but it's also stated that the magical cosmic jellyfish is trying to live through the people it grants power to. It gives them a piece of itself to carry around and see the world with. You know what that means, the big old jellyfish in the sky is still us. Yes, we're still up there as cosmic jellyfish particles that live through these characters and relate to them. It could introduce shardnanigans, and I wouldn't bat an eye. Steelheart by Brandon Sanderson has a similar variation of this, where the conflict drive is so bad that it turns anyone who uses their powers into a supervillain. This is caused by Calamity, which is a weird thing in the sky that you don't really understand when you finish the books either. I think that the shards reside wherever your understanding stops. Rather, where it's supposed to stop. The horror terrors from Homestuck, eldritch beings that may occasionally influence the story but are just treated as part of the reality, might be a good example. I kind of just assume they're the ones who orchestrated the game that Homestuck takes place in, too. Let's talk about the game, actually, because it's one aspect of this premise that I kind of glossed over before. Often a variation of this premise is made to be a game, with the shards as the audience and an excuse to throw in elements that spice things up, keep the readers and the assholes in the capital on the edge of their seats for what happens next. I call this a narrative analysis tool because I think it can help a lot of writers and readers alike understand the nature of stories better. You can tell me to envision my audience all you like, maybe it'll help, but that doesn't change the fact that I still understand things best in terms of fantasy. So yes, saying, 
Just imagine your audience is a cosmic being within your universe whose purpose is to learn from it using conflict before destroying it. It's way more helpful to me than anything about my real life audience. At that point, you can think of almost anything in a fantasy story as a shard with just a slightly different MO than Scion and Eden. By using this tool, people with a tendency towards fancy version can look at their stories more critically and imagine those shards at work. What this shouldn't be is a ready-made set of excuses for shitty writers to pull out whenever someone critiques them. Well, it could be, but you'd just look like a shitty writer for one simple reason. You can't just win the game. That's boring. It's like what they say about plans in movies. If everything goes according to plan, the plan becomes a spoiler. It doesn't just come down to introducing unexpected elements, either. At some point, you've got to upend the board, or it'll look like you're just going through the motions. And no matter what the hell Doc Scratch says, that's not as fun as being thrown for a loop-de-loop. -loop. Well, unless you're one of those people who looks up spoilers for the whole book to avoid emotional turmoil. Like, excuse me? If you don't want to anxiously pace around because you're so worried about the characters, or spend two days in your room crying when one of them is cruelly ripped from existence, then why are you even reading? Katniss doesn't just win, she breaks the rules. If the game still exists as we understand it by the end of whatever saga is happening, then the audience will just be waiting for that to happen forever, and walk away disappointed when it doesn't. Even when a game is just the focus of one little part of the story, it tends to buck right the fuck off the rails. I mean, look at the Chunin exams from Naruto, or what I think was one of the best season closers, and worst follow-ups, I've ever watched. I won't say anymore because I wouldn't want to spoil it for you, but at this point you kind of should expect your expectations to end up disoriented in the middle of the woods with no memory of how they got there. They should go on an adventure is what I'm suggesting. The reigning king of this kind of excitement is, of course, Scion himself. The game started out broken from the moment Dr. Mother and Fortuna murdered a Lovecraftian horror, which is a good thing because it was a game they were always destined to lose. It was broken enough to still be playable, but in the end, Taylor and Amy had to break it even more to finally win, because a win was always against the rules. There's a term in art history, mis en abin, which describes the concept of things nesting in one another, that there's always another layer. So I'd like to call whatever this essay describes, Premise en Abim. The thing to remember is if you zoom your story out to include one of those meta-narrative elements like Worm does, that element must still act as a story in itself. I hope you enjoyed further exploring this concept. I really hope you enjoyed it because I have another video planned right around the bend. Yes, that's it, precisely. Our study of the entities has...